set. All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Guillermo Berganza, and I'm pleased to welcome you all to today's event, the legacy of Marcos Canul in Belize. The rise of democracy in Belize is rooted in popular resistance and elite politics. Naturally, rebellions against oppressive authority were common activities carried out by the Maya and African ethnic groups, uh, such as the Maya rebellion in Tipu, Belize, that expelled Spanish invaders, the constant raiding of British logwood camps, which was often led by Marcos Cano himself, <clears throat> and also the labor movements of the 1930s, just to mention a few. All of these popular rebellions had one thing in common. They fought for liberty and self-determination against tyranny and oppression from European colonizers. In this sense, Maya and African resistance were underpinnings for analyzing revolutionary egalitarian democratic reactions in Belize. Popular resistance against colonial oppression in Belize have drawn and will continue to draw significantly from colonial rebellions and heroes such as Marcos Canul, who serve as a fountain of inspiration for freedom. With that said, we hope that you enjoy this event. Our first presenter is from Orange Walk Town. His educational background includes a diploma from St. John's College High School, an associate's degree in history and economics from St. John's College Junior College, and a bachelor's degree in history from the University of Belize. His teaching career started in 2004, and he has since been teaching and researching history. He is currently a teacher at the St. John's Junior College. He has also been a member of the Referendum Commission. In 2016, he was asked by the Social Security Board to be a part of a debate on going to the ICJ. And he's also the founding member of the Belize History Association. Guys, let's welcome Mr. Gian Vasquez, who will present on the impact of the caste war in Belize. Gian. Good afternoon, everyone. I practice a Maya greeting, and maybe uh, Adela could correct me. Uh, I think it's Bashka Walik. Bashka Walik, everyone. Did I say that correct, Miss Adela? Bashka Walik. Bashka Walik, because I know my grandfather used to say, Bashka Mentik Shipa, and that used to be, what are you doing, boy? So that was my grandfather's greeting to me every time he saw me, Bashka Mentik Shipa. Uh, so Bashka Walik, everybody. Uh, I'm going to be presenting, I hope my time hasn't started yet, but I'm going to be presenting basically an overview of the Kaswar and uh, how it has impacted Belize and how events on the Yucatan Peninsula came to, in a sense, transform the panorama here in Belize. So I'm going to share my screen. I have a little PowerPoint here that I created to kind of guide us in this discussion. So I'm going to do an overview and I'm going to start with the caste war. So I'm going to look at the war itself. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the caste war and its start in the Yucatan Peninsula. So it begins and I'm going to try to encapsulate it rather quickly so that we understand and we have a background uh, about this war. So the caste war starts in the Yucatan Peninsula. We must understand who Maya people are and how Maya people saw the world. At that time, they were agricultural people. And in terms of territory, there were no boundaries per se. In terms of polities that existed, Maya saw their polities extend to wherever the last villages were, to wherever the last cornfields were, that uh, people pledge allegiance to their polity. And that is how they saw boundaries. So there was no, the, 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 on the river creates a boundary. In Yucatan in particular, they were disenfranchised from their land. The Mexicans, the Spaniards, then Mexicans uh, removed them, took away their land. And so they wanted back their land. The Yucatecans who called the Yucatan Peninsula home wanted independence and autonomy from a Mexican federal government. 
And so they started an independence movement and declared independence of Yucatan from the federal states of Mexico. With this, they had gained support from the Maya, but under the auspices that the Maya would be given land, would be given the opportunity to be autonomy them, autonomous themselves, to be able to elect their own leaders and to carry out their own laws within their respective polities. And this is how uh, the, the beginning of this caste war is going to start. Why? Because the Yucatecans who had promised the Maya land and promised, made all of these promises for the Maya to support the Yucatecan independence, reneged on these promises. They did not change the situation for the Maya who simply wanted to have access to their own land, to be able to produce for their families, for their community. As a result of that, two things. One, the Yucatecans had already armed the Maya for the fight for independence. And so the Maya now have weapons. The second thing there is that the Yucatecan uh, government who had declared independence thought that they could easily destroy this Maya group because they saw the Maya as beneath them, peasants on the periphery, not a part of the center of authority. And so they thought that it could be easy to destroy this Maya resistance. The resistance or the rebellion started as a result of a Maya named Manuel Antonio Ay. In 1847, he was found with a letter signed by another Maya chief, Cecilio Che. And that letter led authorities to find discussions about insurrection against the Yucatecan government. As a result of that, Manuel Antonio A. I was tried in Valladolid. He was found guilty and he was hanged. His son was present there when he was hanged. Uh, as a result of the hanging of Manuel Antonio I, Jacinto Pat and Cecilio Che begin a war against the Yucatecan authority. They rally all the Maya groups on the Yucatan Peninsula against this incursion, and it was a systematic incursion that had occurred from the arrival of the first Spaniel. And the Maya had reached a tipping point. And now, being armed, decided to change the tide of history. And so they started to attack Spanish settlements. And in fact, they not only attacked Spanish settlements, they killed what they referred to as Los Blancos. And they were killing the whites primarily the white men, killing all of them for the atrocities that they had done to the Maya in all the years preceding this. Cecilia Che in particular was upset because of what the, what he called the Blancos did to the people on, in his village when they went to try to arrest him. And so the Maya in unison rise up against this persistent threat by the Yucatecans. The Maya were so successful in the initial start of this that by uh, that they had conquered almost four-fifths of the peninsula. The only two places left for the Blancos, as they were, as the Maya referred to them, were Merida and Campeche, the only two fortified areas. And from there, the Yucatecans were preparing to flee. But somehow, uh, historians, some historians say, some uh, oral history says that the Maya did not continue to Merida or Campeche because crop time had started or it was time to plant corn and the Maya returned back to their plantations to ensure that their families would be fed. At least that is what was considered to be the reason why they did not take Merida and Campeche. Now, as I mentioned, the Maya are killing the Yucatecans. The Yucatecans receive reinforcement from the federal government. They join back the federal government and become a part of Mexico. Uh, the reinforces, the reinforcements that they receive from uh, Mexico City allow them to push back the Maya. And they begin the same atrocities that the Maya had done to them. And they begin to kill innocent Maya. 
and they begin to raid all villages, killing Maya systematically. This leads the Maya at this point to begin to lose hope and begin to realize that they are going to lose this war against the federal government. But in 1851, something occurs. There is a resurgence of the Maya uh, by the development in Chan Santa Cruz. You have the arrival of what is called the Talking Cross. The story goes that one of the leaders of the Kusub, the Chan Santa Cruz Maya, that later become known as the Kusub, find a cross and they build a tongue around that cross. That cross, the cross begins to speak to them, and that renews the hope of the Maya to fight the, these invaders, these people that they see as, uh, for lack of a better term, slave masters who want to enslave them and take their land. And so the talking cross becomes that cult from which they begin to fight. At this point in time, uh, I'm, I'm not touching what's happening in Belize because I'm going to come back and look at this period because this period is important. This is going to be one of the first periods that you have migrations into Belize. So the talking cross cult is created, the Maya continue the fight. At the same time that this fight is continuing, some of the Maya are tired of the fight. And so they develop a small group called Indios Pacificos. About four Maya groups decide that they want peace and sign an agreement with the federal government of Mexico to live in peace. And the Mexican government says, we are going to allow you to have your own leaders, be autonomous, no taxes. That creates a conflict between these Indus Pacificos and the Kusop, which is again going to impact us. The Indus Pacificos, one of their group was called the Chichen Hamaya, and they are going to divide into two groups, into Ikaiche San Pedro. And that's going to impact Belize as well. So this is just setting up the, the actual uh, foundation for our discussion. So now I'm going to look at the impact on Belize and how the class war impacts Belize. One of the first impacts, uh, these are just pictures of what was happening. This was the Maya pursuing the, the, the Yucatecans, Merida, Campeche there, uh, the main Maya centers, Chichen Ha, Santa, Santa, Chan Santa Cruz, Teosuco, Tepish. These are the areas that the actual fighting started by Adolid. By Adolid was captured by the Maya. And I'll show you the wall of where the Maya were going. Important also is to look that the Maya did not see the Rio Hondo as a border, right? In this map here that you're seeing on your screen, you are going to see that there is Mexico, Guatemala, Belize. And you're going to, all of this is representative of the San Pedro series that emerges. And you have one leader here, Asuncion Ek, who controls all of these villages that you see that go in, uh, in Guatemala, Belize. And then you have portions of it in Mexico as well. So it's important to understand that the Mayan did not see the Rio Hondo as a border and their territory extended to wherever their people were and they were farming and they were in control of that land and using that, utilizing that land. So the impacts I'm going to divide into three. I'm going to talk about trade, the conflicts, the migration. In terms of trade, one of the first impacts you're seeing is the powder trade. It's referred to as the powder trade. The British, Belize was an entry part for British goods. Merchants from Belize sold British goods to Mexico, to Guatemala. In particular, to the Mexicans, they were selling, and not the Mexicans, but Chan Santa Cruz Maya, guns, ammunition. And this was a vital trade for the Chan Santa Cruz Maya who were fighting the Yucatecan government, the federal government. Why? Because it provided them the resources to be able to fight. And for the British, it created uh, what the Mexicans called a contraband trade. Because apart from guns, other goods were smuggled into Mexico using the Kusob Maya. The Kusob Maya also began to hire themselves out at certain periods in time. So British, the British here in Belize, 
as agricultural workers to gain a little extra for the fight. And so the Kusop became a vital part of the labor in British Honduras. This gun trade is going to be pivotal in the treaties that Britain is going to make, especially with Mexico and Mexico recognizing our territorial boundaries. Because Mexico, the Mexican government, very concerned about the chance and the Cruz Maya. Like, for example, in 1853, when they signed a treaty with the Chichen Hamaya to, for peace, they, uh, the man from the Chichen, man, Chichen Hamaya, 400 men to fight the Cruz of Maya, and for the Chichen Hamaya to aggravate the British and to stop the gun trade. Similarly, when Mexico signs a treaty with Britain, for the Rio Hondo to be the border between Mexico and this country called Belize. One of their, one of their, one of their uh, stipulations was that Britain stops selling guns to the Cruz of Maya. So pivotal, the street, because it plays right into the hands of the British and it becomes a little trump card for them to be able to negotiate with the Mexicans. The second impact, conflict. And by conflict, we mean uh, issues with the Maya and people here in Belize in the first instance. Right? Before 1847, there was already conflict. The Maya had never abandoned the territory. And there are records prior to 1847, prior to the Cold War, of Maya obstructing British lagwood cutting, mahogany cutting in the northern side of Belize. Again, the Maya at that point, they could not be pinned down to one village, to one area, or we could not identify where they came from. But from 18, 1847 onward, you can see certain uh, events taking place. Like, for example, June 12, 1847, there's a raid on the mahogany camps in the west. Then in Rio Bravo, there's another raid in Rio Bravo. Then in 1848, there's a raid on the New River and Hill Bank. Then in 1853, the Chichen Hamaya lead a uh, raid again in Belize. In 1856, you have Luciana Zook leading a raid on Toledo Young, on uh, Young Toledo and Company in the, Hill Bank, in the Hill Bank region again. Apart from that, you have 1866 incursions into Quam Hill. And at this point, there is a demand for rent, especially from the leadership of Marcos Canul. Marcos Canul then leads the Battle of San Pedro in 1866. Well, it was Rafael Chan, one of uh, Marcos Canul's generals that meet the British coming to San Pedro, which leads to them defeating the British there. In 1867, the British burned San Pedro, destroy several other villages in that San Pedro series. Marcos Canul keeps busy, takes Corozal, April 1870, goes to Orinjuak, 1872. But with the death of Canul, the uh, incursions did not stop. Why? Because in 1875, the Ikai Maya claim up to Holotunich, which is in Belizean territory. They come and they tell the the, super, the the superintendent at that time that they have authority or they claim up to Hollow Tunich. 1879, they lead raids the Igaichi again, the Rio over the Rio Hondo. Then in 1882, because of the waning force that they have and the British refusing to sell to the Igaichi, they make peace with the British. And then 1884, there's another peace accord with the Chan Santa Cruz Maya. I'm going to look at migration because migration is the most impacting part of this. This conflict shows resistance. Mr. Vasquez, I think we are at the uh, two minutes mark already. Two minutes, I have two minutes. Okay, yes, let sir. me try, right? These are just pictures of those of those uh, of those peace accords. 
Now, when we look at migration, migration is very important because when this war occurs, starts, it's going to lead to people coming over into Belize. And you have different sets of people coming over. Like, for example, the Mestizos come. They come, they settle, according to Grant Jones, Corazal, San Esteban, Consejo, main Mestizo villages. Now, the Mestizos are descendants of the Yucatecans and see themselves more Yucatecans than Maya. But you also have the Maya from Chichen Ha seeking refuge. You have Maya from Ikeche seeking refuge. San Pedro Maya are going to come to Palmar. You have the Chan Santa Cruz Maya coming to this region. So this is kind of a map showing the migration. These are the clusters of San Pedro series that are going to make Belize their home. And I'm just going to highlight some names here for us to understand this uh, migration. 1848, you have the arrival of Florencio de la Vega, Juan Carrillo, right? Florencio de la Vega, Juan Carrillo are mestizo merchants and they settle in San Esteban and they, they flee the ravages of what the Maya are doing on the Yucatan Peninsula. Similarly, you have Juan Cal coming to San Esteban and Juan Cal is from Ikaiche, right? Juan Cal is trying to flee from the ravages of war that's happening on the peninsula as well and come. There's a story and he is, uh, he is here in San Esteban and moves to other villages. You also have at San Esteban the arrival of a guy of Marcos Canul's brother, Susano Canul, who has children in San Esteban. There's a, a account by Carl that tells you of Marcos Canul coming to, the, to San Roman and uh, seeking Canul, Susano Canul's children because Susano Canel was going to be tried for crimes he had committed in San Esteban and the children were being held ransom. That's how powerful Marcos Canel was. Similarly, Asuncion Ek leads a whole half of Chichen Ha into Belize in 1857 in the San Pedro series. Then in 1858, you have the fall of Bacalar. When Bacalar is taken, there is this famous Corazaleño, Jose Maria Rosado. He comes out in some of the pictures in the peace accords. He is a, a mestizo. He is captured by the Chan Santa Cruz Maya, taken to Chan Santa Cruz Maya, to Chan Santa Cruz as a boy, to teach the Chan Santa Cruz uh, children Spanish and English, right? And that's the reason why he was not killed. And his uncle rescues or pays a ransom to get him here. In 1860, for example, when the Chichen Ha, when Chichen Ha is raised, that causes a migration to Santa Clara Ikeche by the Zook function and by Ek into San Pedro. And then in 64 with Marcos Canul, there is more migration into Belize, right? In terms of like, for example, uh, Shaibe, in 1884, we see a migration of uh, Antonio of Bonifacia Novello. And she recounts that she was uh, a part of the Chan Santa Cruz Maya. So we know that there is migration into Belize and uh, Grant Jones puts it at about 10,000 people migrated initially, and then you continuously have waves of migration. So it was not a migration of just in 1847. There's a continuous wave of migration coming into Belize, populating north, the north of Belize. And this is going to impact because it's going to bring agriculture, corn, sugar, and it's going to bring laborers to Belize. Do I still have time, Delmar? <laughs> Sorry for taking too long. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Vasquez, for your very informative presentation. Our next presenter is from the Libertad Village in the Corozal District. She is a retired nurse, and she was the clinical director of the Jacobs Rehabilitation Farm Center in Pachancan Village in the Corozal District. She has volunteered at the Community Restore Center in Corozal Town for one year and a half, where she taught adults and children how to read and write. She is currently the lead person for the Hope and Faith Al Anon Family Support Group in Corozal. She is currently the president of To One Masewalon, which is an NGO and means We Are Maya, that seeks to instill the pride of being Yucatec Maya in Belize. 
She's very active with the Corozal Local Tourism Committee and the Belize Tourism Industry Association, Corozal Chapter. Her latest endeavors are Rum Punch Belize Tours Limited and Maya Wedding Destinations. Let's welcome Miss Adela Pedersen Vallejos, who will present on Who is Marcos Canul? Mrs. Pedersen, can you hear us? Mrs. Pedersen. Seems like we're having some uh, technical difficulties with uh, Miss, Mrs. Pedersen. Let's move on to the next presenter. Then we, we can, hello. Okay, I thought I heard something. Okay. So, our next presenter was born in Corozal Town and lived in San Narciso Village until he was eight years old. For the next 10 years of his life, he, att he attended the Xavier College in Corozal Town and uh, later moved to Belize City, where he earned an associate's degree from St. John's College, Junior College. In 1967, he was teaching at the Xavier College and in 1973, uh, he became mayor of Corozal Town. In 1975, he was studying at the Montreal, Canada, uh, where he earned a bachelor's in education. In 1981, he was the education officer of the Corozal district. In 2006, he was teaching history at the Corozal Junior College. And in 2012, he participated in a ceremony of the end of Bakhtun 13 at the Chaktemal Temple in Corozal town. And in April 16, 2017, he was at the Central Park celebrating the triumphant occupation of Corozal town by the Maya under Marcos Canul. It was during this time that the To'one Masewalon organization was formed. Let's welcome Mr. Roy Rodriguez, who will present on the invasion of Corozal. Mr. Roy. I think we must be having, I am getting a lot of messages about um, thunder and rain and lightning. Hello. Mr. Roy. Parts of Belize, uh, it could be that issue. Okay, sorry to interrupt, Delmer. Mr. Roy, I think you're muted, Mr. Roy. Your mic is muted. Mr. Roy. Mr. Roy, your mic is muted. Yes, ma'am, can you unmute him? Yes, I did twice. Oh. But I think it, I think it's on his end. Let's go. Let's go with Miss Adela then, because Miss Adela was supposed to be yes, Okay. Is All right, Delmar, can, can you notify Mr. Roy? Okay, good. All right, let's go, Miss Adela. Okay, so. Our next presenter, again, once more, is from Libertad Village in Corozal District. She is a retired nurse, and she was the clinical director of the Jacobs Rehabilitation Form Center in Pachacan Village in the Corozal District. She has volunteered at the Community Restore Center in Corozal Town for one year and a half, where she taught adults and children how to read and write. She is currently the lead person for the Hope and Faith al -Anon Family Support Group in Corozal. She is currently the president of To'one Masewalon NGO, which means we are Maya, that seeks to instill the pride of being Yucatec Maya in Belize. She is very active with the Corozal Local Tourism Committee and the Belize Tourism Industry Association, Corozal Chapter. Her latest endeavors are the Rum Punch Belize Tours Limited, and the Maya Wedding Destinations. Let's welcome Miss Adela Pedersen Vallejos, who will present on Who is Marcos Canul? 
Good afternoon. Mrs. Pedersen, go you ahead. Can hear me. Yes. Um, am I clear? Okay. I am presenting on Marcus Canol, and uh, what we know definitively of Marcus Canol was that he was wounded on September 1st, 1872 in Orange Walk, Belize, and he died a few days later. I'm not unsure exactly what date, but anywhere from the 2nd to the 5th of September. But who was he? He became the Batab, the general of the Aikai Che Maya. When Luciano Zuc, the Batab, the Aikai Che Maya died in December of 1864. So what qualities did he possess? The qualities of leadership, determination, and commitment to the cause. So his leadership abil abilities is shown in the fact that he led his troops on various attacks on the British invaders. Um, he was a leader to his troop of more than 125 men at the Battle of Quam Hill in 1866, uh, in which two British were killed and he took 79 pr prisoners. He put up fierce fights on numerous attacks, as will, will be told and is being told by our researchers and historians present today. He had determination because he was fighting for the rights of the indigenous people of these lands. And and he knew that if the British took over, the people would lose the right to their lands and also their personal rights as given to the indigenous peoples of the lands. He had commitment to the cause and the ultimate commitment is to give one's life for the cause, the cause of the rights of um, land heritage and indigenous people rights. He knew that when the colonizers took over the land, the natives would lose their birthright and these rights. In 1866, there were 10,000 Maya living in Shaibe and Pachacan, Corozal District, Belize. So today, Mr. Roque Basarachea of Pachacan Village recounts to me that when the British instilled the new laws in the land in the time of his childhood, that one could not burn on their land as they used to. And if the embers flew across the way and started another fire, the property owner was immediately put in jail by the British. Uh, Marcus Canul was also a force to be reckoned with. He instilled fear and panic within the British troops. On December 21st, 1866 at San Pedro Yalbac, five British was, were killed and 16 wounded. British commander McKay fled into Belize town the British colony was in a panic. An appeal was sent out for help from Jamaica and Cuba. They asked for ships to use to evacuate if necessary. They then set up a militia and thereafter received support from the West Indian Regiment. On October 30th, 1867, Captain John Carmichael traveled to Yucatan and returned with a letter from Bonifacio Novello to the governor stating, one, to guard Carozal. He would block Aikaiche Trail to give the alarm or give the alarm. And for the governor to grant him permission of pursuit of enemy into Belize territory. And if he caught Marcus Cano, he would turn him in. We know that there were many labels imposed upon Marcus Cano or biases. They called him a rebel. He was not a rebel, he was a Maya chief, a Batab. He was an indigenous person with all the indigenous rights of the land. They called him a thief. As a Batab of his people, he had a right to ask for taxes for use of the land the invaders were exploiting and continued to encroach upon. They called them pagans. So we know that if something is not understood or different from your belief, then it's quite convenient to attach such, such a label to discredit and subjugate. Said that he, well, he executed attacks because that was the consequence of encroachment and invasion of Maya territory. So with what purpose are these labels attached? The purposeful neglect to relevant facts has the focus to discredit and to eradicate from memory and from history as had been proven in the case of Marcus Cano. The British not only invaded, but continue its attack on the Northern Belize Maya. On February 9, 1867, 
British attacked San Pedro Yalbac with rocket tubes, launchers, missiles on the thatch roof. And the intention, as it is written, is to return the Maya to a state of respect for Her Majesty's law. So they had, they went on to unleash the same treatment on San Jose, Santa Rosa, and other little hamlets. And as is written, all with equally satisfying results. On September the 1st, 1872, Canal Canul attacked the village of Orangewa. He was wounded and later died, as mentioned. The general to succeed Marcus Canul was Raphael Chan, who begged forgiveness of the queen, stating and referring to the queen, who had reason to be annoyed. This is a complete reversal of Batab leadership. So what was he fighting for? Of course, the rights of the indigenous people. The British were the invaders. They were encroaching on the native people's territory. They were squatters who shortly thereafter started to sell off the land. They were pillaging the natural resource of the indigenous land without recourse. Kano said, if you are using the land, then you must pay taxes. Later with the setup of colonial rules, the British took over all the land belonging to the indigenous people and then made it clear that natives can use the land for crop planting, but they must pay lease fee to the land owner, owners, such as the Carmichaels and the Schofields. Also, the natives were forbidden to cut down any mahogany tree whatsoever. Mr. Roque Basarachea of Pachacan Village, Curazao, Belize, recounts to me, if this was discovered, the people were immediately put in jail. This practice continued until the 1960s. Land reform was negotiated by the Honorable George Cadle Price, who convinced the large landowners to give back parts of the land to the native people. Each farmer received 30 acres of land. My uncle, Mr. Martin Cano from Libertad Village, Corozal District, recounts to me, yes, we could plant on the land, but we had to pay land lease to the landowners. We had no land of our own. After 1960s is when the local people were then able to plant sugarcane and other crops on their own fields in Northern Belize. Yet today, many indigenous people continue without claims to their lands. Much of the lands continue to be owned by the trust of the large landowners, such as vast pieces of land in the village of Caledonia, Corozal District, Belize. Mr. Geronimo Navarro tells me, I am from Caledonia. I live in Caledonia, but I don't own any land. I have no rights to land. My references for today, a book by named The Cast War of Yucatan by Nelson Reed, 1963. Chapter to refer to The Empire of the Cross, 1867 to 1900. Pages 201, 200. And four. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Pedersen, for that wonderful presentation. The next presenter is a Belizean of Maya Yucatec ethnicity who was born and raised in the Maya village of San Pablo in the Orange Rock district. He is a descendant of the Crusob Maya in Belize, and from a young age, he was exposed to the Maya spirituality, which he continues to practice today. He has promoted his culture through music with the Maya metal band Hanal Pishan, releasing the albums In Lu'umil Belize, which means My Land Belize, and the Ku Ayob Ku Ohol, which means Singing of the Gods. He also uses illustrations through social media to educate others and to make talks to students about the Maya culture. Nohochmak Chuk is an active member of the NGO To'one Masewalon, which is for the preservation and promotion of the Maya culture in Northern Belize. Let's welcome Mr. Andy Chuk, who will present on the Battle of Orange Wak and Untold History. Mr. Andy. Um, uh, am I being heard uh, clearly? Yes, sir, I can hear you clearly and see you clearly. Okay, Malabachin al Kin Atitula Clash. Today I will be presenting on the untold story of the Battle of Orange Wak. Now, when we research history, we'll always realize that there are different versions to the same story. 
and the Battle of Orange Walk is no exception. The problem in Belize have been that the only version that we have been exposed to have been the version of the British, one that promotes the British as the heroes and Can give us the the man, might not end. were bad and That's evil. The green one of the top. I see somebody there. Hi, hi, yes, let, let me mute it quickly. Let me mute it quickly. Hold on. Okay. How much people are? Okay. Uh -huh. So um. Sorry about that, Andy. Uh, go ahead. He promoted the Maya as bad and evil. But to understand the Battle of Orange War, we need to understand the Maya cast and Marcos Canul because. By the 18th, 19th, and 20th century, the world of the Maya was drastically changing. How? The Europeans that came, the foreigners, were now creating countries inside indigenous land. So countries like Belize, Guatemala, part of Mexico, El Salvador, and Honduras was being created inside Maya land. The white elites of this nation were creating borders without consulting without asking the indigenous people. And the Maya were trapping this change. So for Marcos Cano, the British were foreigners. And if they wanted to use Maya land, they need to pay for it. Uh, can you put the um, first picture? So apart from the indigenous claim, by 1853, the white Yucatecos, the Maya Yucatec group known as the Pacificos del Sur, co-signed and sponsored by the British. Exactly the person that signed was Lieutenant Governor Woodhouse on behalf of the colonial government. So they signed a treaty and this treaty, there were many things that were agreed. One of them is that the Maya will stop fighting the white Yucatecos or Tsulub, how we call them. That um, they can choose their leader and they can maintain control of the areas and resources that they are living in, which included Northwestern Belize. As we can see in the video, that would be the yellow part. So since it was co-signed by the British, the Maya thought that now the British was giving it more legitimacy to their ownership in the white man system, in the white man law. Let's remember that in those days, the Maya could not go to court to claim it. So when they did not want to pay rent, Marcos Canul and the Maya simply read it. But by 1870, Marcos Canul wanted to create a different kind of relationship with the British. And they started to negotiate. There were many things that were agreed. And of course, one of them was the payment of rent for the use of Maya land. But two, which led us to the Battle of Orange Rock, there was an agreement of exchange of prisoners that if somebody from the British settlement break the law and he was trapped by the Maya, he would be given back to the magistrate, to the British, and he and they could do their judgment. And if the Maya, somebody break the law, the British would give the Maya back to the Maya Batap, to the leader, and they will do their own judgment. Now there was kind of peace until in 1872, a man named Jose Maria Manzanero and his wife were imprisoned at Orange Rock Town by the British. Jose Maria Manzanero was Marcos Canul captain. According to the testimonies, September 1st, Marcos Canul and the Maya went in front of Orange Rock asking why they have Jose Maria Manzanero and his wife imprisoned. So according to the testimonies, he said, or claim that they were being imprisoned with no formal judgment and that it break the agreement that the British and the Maya had. The British continue to not give no answer. So after a while, Marcos Cano started to ask that the prisoners be given back to them. The only answer he got from the British was an aggressive one, a rain of bullets, which angered the Maya and they suddenly attacked Orange Rock. According to the British reports, it was a six hour battle, 50 Maya dead plus unknown number of injured. And on the British side, there were three dead, one civilian, two soldiers, 17 civilians injured, 
and 14 soldiers injured. That day, Marcos Canul was wounded, but he never died that day. He died three to four days after. That would be like September 4 to September 5th. Now, if we take these testimonies into account, we will see, we, we will realize that the British were lying when they said it was a surprise attack because the Maya had been in front of Orange Rock for a long time asking for Jose Maria Manzanero and his wife. Something that we need to take into consideration also is that by 1870, the Ikaichi army was not as big as the 1950s. So this means that they would do guerrilla attacks, which the Maya were pros on it. They would get in and get out of Orange Rock Town as soon as possible. But instead, they were trapped in a six hour battle. And the number of deaths on the British side give us the feeling that the British were too ready, too prepared for that battle. In other words, they have planned to provoke Marcos Canul to kill him. Let's remember that this is not the first time that they try to kill Marcos Canul. According to Joaquin Rejon, a mestizo of Corozal town who gave his testimony in 1869, he said that the British planned and tried to kill Marcos Canul, but they failed at Corozal town. So after the death, of Marcos Canul, there are many leaders that continue to claim Northwestern beliefs using the 1853 treaty. One of them was General Gabriel Tamay and General Santiago Pech. But by 1801 to the 1830s, the case war was declared over many times by the Mexicans. And I need to clarify this. The Yucatec Maya, we never surrender. We never signed no peace treaty that we were surrendering, nor there was a final battle of victory. And even today, for many Mayas to the peninsula, the case war continues, but in a different form. So according to our books, the books of Chilambalam says that this war will not be last in this land because this land will be reborn. So by the 1940s, 50s and 60s, there was a lot of discrimination from the British and the Hispanics or Mestizos against the Maya in Northern Belize. These have been people that the Maya had been at war with. Now they were living close to us. So speaking of Marcos Canul of the case war was a big no. So they only used to speak about the case war between themselves. And this is how the case war survived on the our days. Can you put that picture number two, at least? So one of the first persons that honored Marcos Canul in public was Nohochmac Domingo Perez, a Mayero elder of Orange Rock Town and descendant of the Ikaiche. So he started to do this since the early 2000s. In September 1st, 2014, he took a read to a monument that is found at Barracks, Orange Rock. Now, this monument, some people call it the Monument of Marcos Canul, which is an incorrect name. That monument was erected to honor the Maya. Sorry, that monument was erected to honor the British and those who fought against the Maya and killed Marcos Canul. But as a way of resistance, as a way of protest, Noch Mac Domingo Perez took the read on September 1st, 2014 at the monument. Can you put picture number three, please? So the second time that Marcos Canul was honored in public. So in this picture we have Nohoch Mac Domingo Perez in the middle, may he rest in peace, Mr. Roy Rodriguez and Miss Adela. So the second time that Marcos Canul was honored in public was April 16, 2016. A group of Maya elders gathered together in Corozal Central Park. They gathered to honor the day that Marcos Canul reached at Orange or at Corozal. That day was April 18, 1870. So this was the second time that they were honoring Marcos Canul in public. That day, a Maya elder even gave a lecture. Could you put the, um, the other picture, please? That Maya elder was Nohochmak Roy Rodriguez. That same day, 
those Maya elders felt motivated, felt inspired, and they founded the group known as Tone Masewalon, which means we are Maya, which is an active Yucatec Maya organization in Northern Belize. And there we see Mr. Roy uh, for that event in April 16, 2016. That, that was the second time that Marcos Canol was honored in public. So after this event, there were different individuals and organizations that started to form and they started to do the same thing, to honor Marcos Hanul in different ways, in social media, events, and in private. For example, in my house, September 1st to September 5th, this year, we put an altar to honor Marcos Hanul. I even did a prayer. Why? Because now Marcos Hanul is an ancestor and he is in the spiritual world, guiding us. So for the Maya of Northern Belize, Hello, Andy. Marcos. Sorry yes. to cut you off, bro. You have two more minutes remaining, okay? Okay, perfectly. <laughs> so for the Maya of Northern Belize, Marcos Canul is not only a historical character, but he's a symbol of resistance, a symbol of struggle, a symbol of anti-imperialism, and one that motivates the Maya to continue preserving their identity. Maya history is Belizean history. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chuk, for your enlightening presentation. Well done. Now, since I've already introduced our next presenter, let's welcome Mr. Roy Rodriguez, who will present on the invasion of Corozal. Mr. Roy, the time is yours. Okay, I'll try to do it fast. In the early hours of April 16, 1870, the Maya Aikaiche General, Marcos Canul, with about 150 armed men, occupied the central plaza in Corozal Town. They came from Orange Walk via the New River uh, to Winnicob. Notice the word Zul, Winnicob, where the day before April the April the 15th, General Marcos Canul had strongly requested Magistrate Dover, Dover in Orange Walk to supply him with boats for his journey to Corozal. Expecting an affirmative answer, the magistrate complied. Shortly after midnight of April 15th, and therefore the early hours of April 16th, the Aikaiche general and his men made a short stop at Caledonia, the village of Caledonia, and from there to the mouth of the New River into the Chactemal Bay, Corozal, and of course, Corozal town. For almost two decades, the white Yucatecos who had settled Corozal after the fall of Bacalar in 1848 to the Maya, and again in 1858, they had lived a life of uneasiness and tension, always expecting a sub Maya attack, but that didn't happen. Instead, it was an Aikaiche Maya military occupation. Forewarned the captain of the Corozal militia, Plumbridge, that's British, Magistrate Adolphus and some people met General Canul on the beach, presumably where the main pier is located now, with the request to leave their arms in some buildings that were on the seashore. General Marcos Canul refused and subsequently marched his men, his armed men into the central plaza, supported strongly by a small group of white Yucatecos led by an individual, by a, a white Yucateco named Laureano Flores. Shortly after this, 
he demanded $3,000 from the British authorities. It was certainly not a ransom because all the people had deserted the town. But General Marcos Canu later explained that it was money he would give to his armed men to placate them for not torching the town. General Marcos Canul would have torched Corozal town as the British had torched nine more than 10 Maya villages in Northwestern Belize, as I think the story has been told already. And, and they did it as a retaliation to a Maya defeat of the British forces in December, 1866. This torching happened in 1867, about three months after the British defeat by the Maya. At nightfall, General Canoe prudently evacuated, evacuated Corozal's central plaza and moved into a rancho, of course, owned by a white Yucateco, where on April 17, in the early morning, he made his way into the Rio Hondo, upriver to Corozalito, south of Albion Island. I think we should make a remark here. Albion Island and Corozalito, those, those were the, like the borders by the, created by the Crusoe and the Aikaiche. So that's why you see Marcos Canu going back, but through uh, uh, Corozalito, which is south of Albion Island, because all down river then to, to, to its mouth, that is the Rio Hondo, the No Kum, um, it was all under guard by the Crusoe Maya. Questions asked to General Marcos Canul during the military occupation, especially from Laureano Flores, which you have mentioned, what have you come here to do? Why didn't you torch Corozal town? In fact, he, he was saying, torch the town. He could have done it, but he did not want to repeat what the British had done to the Maya. Now, a brief analysis of the context or the circumstances in which the military occupation occurred will follow. Just some points here. Uh, the 1853 Treaty of Belize, which has been mentioned already, when the British in cahoots with the Yucatecan state governments and also the federal governments divided the Maya into two groups, Los Pacificos, uh, Del Sur, as I think uh, Andy mentioned, and Los Bravos Rebeldes, the Crusoe. Crusoe Maya, who were against peace with their oppressors, attacked Chichanha and Ikeche and Ikeche and caused the migration of hundreds, if not thousands, of Maya Ikeche into northwestern Belize, now the Orange Walk district. General Marcos Canul was aware of the Maya Ikaiche British Treaty, that is the 1853, where British authorities in Belize, especially the Lieutenant Governor Woodhouse, agreed to respect Maya ownership of Northwestern Belize, ownership of lands. Huh? Uh, which was not ceded by Spain to the British in the 1873 and 1876 treaties of Versailles and the Convention of London. I, I, I think that in one map I saw, you could have seen that, I don't know if it's from Gian or Andy, uh, that division, because all land west of that line from the Rio Hondo to the Belize River belong to the Maya. The IKJ general hence refused to accept British sovereignty 
over Northwestern Belize or all of Belize. He also strongly opposed the British boundary lines being, dry, being drawn at the time, the 1860s and 70s, between the tributaries of the Blue Creek and Rio Bravo. As I noted, I think Gian mentions that, that finally the Aikaiche agreed or made some agreement on this, but not the Crusoe Maya. So we'll have to research that. Two, Corozal in the 1870s was a prospering community uh, with a number of ranchos planting sugar cane and, and, and being able to export sugar to England. So they were profitably growing sugar cane. And the Maya often working for them, some, but mainly engaged in their milpa, in their milpas, pro producing or planting corn and producing the food to the town. A population of over 5,000 uh, uh, people in Corozal, mostly white Yucatecos, uh, even I think to historians, even rival the population of Belize, uh, Belize town at the time. Uh, and uh, a very small, a very tiny, maybe a 2% population in Corozal town of the Maya. Um, you understand that the Yucatecos, those white Yucatecos in Corozal town were enemies of the Crusop Maya, especially showing their disdain to the Corozal Maya, to the Corozal Maya Crusop who lived in villages like Shai Bay, Pachacan, Yochen, Chanchen, San Arciso, and so on. And this is a history that still has to be researched and, uh, and explained to the people. In other words, the history of the oppression, of Maya oppression by the Yucatec, by the white Yucatecos in Colorado. Excuse me, Mr. Roy. Yes. You have two more minutes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the third point I want to mention is the anglo crusoe maya friendship and the anglo aikaiche maya hostility. I think uh, uh, bringing down to, to simplicity here is that, that the crusoe maya were friendly to the British and the aikaiche maya were not friendly, were hostile to the British. The British had, why the British had been supplying, as, as you all know, arms to the crusoe and uh, and the arms they were being provided with were used to attack uh, Chichanha and Aikache and causing the big, big, huge migration of, of Aikache Maya to Orange Rock or what is today uh, Northwestern Belize. The British after the Battle of San Pedro had banned the use of arms uh, crossing the Rio, Ondo, but this ban applied to the Aikaiche after the 1867 uh, raid or torching of the ten, nine or 10 villages in, in Northwestern Belize. It's clear then the British hostility to the Aikaiche and also Aikaiche to the British uh, has had been the, the, one of the most important reasons for, for uh, Marcos to make his journey to Corozal and occupy it. He, Marcos claimed that he was looking for Crusoe Maya, but in fact, what he was doing is showing Maya uh, uh, unfriendliness, Maya disagreement with the British over the treatment of the Crusoe and over the disrespect of the 1853 accord where uh, uh, all Northwestern Belize was Maya land. And as, as Andy mentioned, and uh, that was the reason why Marcos Canul then being, being a, a true uh, emancipator, you know, he was looking at that to free, to have the people free to own their land. So we know that at this time, most of Corozal, all of, all of Corozal was 
British owned was. And uh, I, I would want to, because of a few minutes, uh, maybe just summarize here. Uh, I think that one of the legacies that we should have of Marcus Canul uh, is that he, as I think Adelita mentioned, he left us with a legacy of resistance, which is enshrined today by the Tony Masewaloon organization, Maya, we are Maya uh, uh, Association. And uh, which of course we are pushing there to the, the another fight. It was not, it's not a fight with arms, no, it's a fight with words and action and, and, and which Tony Masewaloon is doing. Also, I'd like to mention uh, one of the legacies of, and has been misinterpreted of Marcos Canul was the reaction of the British to, to build what is called today the Fort Barley, Fort Barley, and which I think people should understand that those, uh, those uh, uh, forts represent British hostility, British hate of the Maya, because they were, they were built there to kill the Maya. And uh, another one that I want to mention uh, briefly is that the Maya pressure at the time, 1866, 1870, 1872, that the Battle of Orange, the Battle of San Pedro and the occupation of Corozal actually pressured, uh, the Maya pressured it, made the 1840, 1854 assembly, uh, uh, assembly that governed Belize to dissolve itself and to declare and to welcome a crown colony government. But before they welcomed a representative government, then a crown colony government, which was direct rule from England. And uh, which later opened the way for agitation to regain representative government, that the people would be represented, represented in a government and for the nationalist, nationalist movement of the 1950s. Um, also, we must mention that uh, Marcos Canul and the pressure also led to the signing of the Spencer Mariscal Treaty. Finally, uh, I think we should think on, on, on these points that I wanted to start saying that I, let me see where I live, uh, that I am. Um, I am looking for uh, part where oh, first thing I, I wanted to mention to everybody here that I am a Maya and not an Indian or mestizo. I am not an atheist or pagan because I'm a Maya, but a Maya who believes in a universal God a very spiritual person. And also, I am proud of our Maya Chactemal temple in Corozal town, which is, and, and it is not a ruin, it's not a ruin, but a living testament of the achievements of our Maya ancestors, a temple which we should respect. I want to thank you for listening. There's much more, but time does not permit. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roy Rodriguez for your very informative presentation. Since 2019, our last presenter has been the vice president and is a founding member of the Northern Maya Association of Belize. Uh, the main mission of this association is the promotion and the safeguarding of the Maya Yucatec heritage. As an avid member of this association, he is a principal researcher and coordinator for the organization uh, where he collects and prepares educational material for different mediums. Currently, he's spearheading the Nuestros Héroes Maya, which is a documentary series airing on Facebook from September 1st to October 12th. He was the producer of Conociendo Nuestras Raices radio show on Love FM, 
an Estéreo Amor, which featured the Maya Yucatec culture. Let's welcome Mr. Arturo Cantun, who will present on the Maya leaders of today. Mr. Cantun, time is yours. Hey, good afternoon and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I'm going to try to make it as quick as possible because I know we're all um, want to keep it within the 10 minutes. So first of all, um, I want to briefly talk to, well, introduce you guys to the Northern Maya Association. This is the group that, that um, since 2017 has been spearheading the recognition of local Maya leaders in the Yucatec community. And uh, this organization started in April of 2017. And what it has uh, principally done is to promote, safeguard and revive the Yucatec Maya heritage of uh, Northern Belize. And this is done through the appreciation, um, creating a platform for cultural appreciation, expression and identity, and to educate our young people about our heritage, the Maya Yucatec heritage. Over the last five years, we have been holding the Maya Heroes um, Day, which is uh, recognized or commemorated on the anniversary of the Battle of Orange Walk, which is on September 1st. And the first one was held in 2017. And since then, we have recognized a number of local leaders. And this allows us an opportunity to highlight the contribution of the indigenous community in nation building and highlight the challenges of the Yucatec Maya of our, our times. So we start with Mr. Solis. Uh, his name is Santiago Manuel Solis, but he is uh, most popularly known as Don Solis. He is originally from the village of Agus Spain Ridge in Orange Walk. And he, if I'm not mistaken, if math is good, he's uh, 79 years old. So Mr. Solis is well known in the community of Orange Walk because he has avidly and actively promoted the Maya Mestizo culture. He comes from a humble family from August Spain Ridge, originally from there. Uh, he started as a primary school teacher. He didn't like it. He moved on to more forest work or jungle work. He, he liked being a lumberjack. He planted spices, he cultivated corn, and then eventually he entered into cane farming along with his father and his father-in-law. And it was during that time that he was very close to his in-laws and his parents that he had a specific or specific liking for the Maya culture that he was in tune to learn the language. He recalls that as a young boy, his parents would only speak to him in Maya and he had to figure out what they were saying. And eventually he would ask his grandparents or his relatives to explain what they were saying in Spanish. And that's how he went about in learning the Maya language. He also learned traditional uh, practices and beliefs like las primicias uh, and los, fi los finados or hanal pishan as, in, as we would say it in Maya. And he also learned the tradition of preparing the candles out of wax. This is bee wax that you collect in the, in the bushes. Mr. Solis has over the last 30 to 35 years been practicing los finados, hanapishan, practicing the novenas and the primicias. And a lot of people, not only in Orange Walk and Corozal know him, he's known basically across the country because he has been recognized before. He has uh, been celebrated for keeping the culture alive. Before COVID, Mr. Solis, along with his um, family, will hold large gatherings of Los, los Dia de los Finados, Hanal Pishan, with uh, big altars in his, in his yard. And the community will come and celebrate with him, learn from him first son about the practice and the traditions. This year, Mr. Solis was recognized as one of our heroes in the Yucatec community. Um, and we, unfortunately, due to the whole COVID regulations, we had to do it in a very small gathering. So that's the reason it was done um, at his house. These are some pictures of the work that Mr. Solis has done, um, which we have been able to capture. Uh, in the lower picture, you see that he there is preparing Los uh, Famous Cochinita Pibil. Here, he is telling a group of students at the Banquitas House of Culture about the traditional Hanal Pishan the way the Mayas used to do it. Um, and here he's up the upper right corner. He's uh, producing a wax candle. The next person 
that has been recognized by the Northern Maya Association uh, as a Maya hero is Donia Chip. She's Miss Silvina Perez, locally uh, known cultural uh, promoter. She's from the village of San Jose Palmar. She was born in 1951 and she has she was heavily influenced by her mother who is a uh, full Maya and her mother has a long history. Her mother came originally from San Jose Yalbac and, and we heard Mr. Roy talk about it. We heard Mr. Um, Mr. Andy talk about you know the displacement of the Maya people that were that had settled in the northwestern part of Belize. So her mother, Miss Silvina's mother, was one of those elders, or at that time she wasn't an elder. At that time she was a young lady. She was 17, 18 years old. I had the opportunity to meet her and talk to her about that opportunity. And she spoke about you know the roots, the traditions, and the stories that her parents and her grandparents told her about that unfortunate time that they had to be replaced. And so Miss uh, Silvina uh, learned a lot from her mother. She learned the Maya language. Uh, she, she learned about the traditions and the practices. But what Miss Silvina liked the most was the religious uh, festivities that came along with the Maya heritage, such as Los Pastores and Las Posadas. And she also liked very much the festivities in the sense of the mestizadas and zapateados. When she was 26 years old, she formed her first group. And since then, a lot of people have known her and a lot of people will bring her, their children and she will also teach them about traditional dances. Uh, a lot of people might know her traveling across uh, the northern part of Belize doing presentations, uh, La Cabeza de Cochino, which is the hoghead dance. She was also known for sewing her own uh, huipiles, which is the traditional women dress that are used um, for festivities. And all of these, she's very at keen in distinguishing. A whipil is not a whipil. She knows exactly what is a whipil and what is a terno, which is a more celebratory uh, kind of dress. She also does her own headdresses. Uh, and currently, while she has started to retire because of age, she is very uh, involved in the celebration of the patron saint of San Jose, which is still celebrated um, in San Jose Palmar. So we celebrate Doña Chev uh, for her contribution to culture. Here you see um, some pictures that showcase her work and her active duties in promoting the culture. Here she's preparing the breads, biscochos that are normally put in the on the hawkhead for uh, the, the traditional dance. The other person that we celebrate uh, is Maestro Yam, Mr. Faustino Yam. He is uh, originally from Cristo Rey Corozal, and he spent his whole life as an educator. And his passion, his pastime, was in the collection of Maya uh, history and teaching, learning and teaching the Maya language and, med and medicinal um, properties. He right now is retired. He retired uh, about 10 years ago, but he continues teaching others about, you know, the traditions of uh, Las Primicias, El Chac Chac, which is the celebration, like a religious celebration when a farmer is about to start planting. And the Chac, well, that will be the Primicias, I'm sorry. And then the Chac Chac is during the period that there is a long drought and the farmers need rain. So this Mr. Yam will be able to explain in detail and he has no, a host of uh, students and teachers and other educators who will visit him in his home and, and he will teach them and tell them about how to practice it and tell them details about how to go about in learning and understanding exactly why it is done. He also practices uh, the Hetzmeg, which is the uh, Maya baptism of a baby. And uh, briefly, it's about talking. I mean, whenever this happens, the child has to be either uh, three months for the girls or four months in the case of a, in the case of a boy. He also practices Hanal Pishan, which is the traditional um, celebration remembrance of the souls who have passed away. Mr. Mr. Yam loves his culture so much 
and he promotes it. He's an ambassador for the Maya um, Yucatec culture, and he has founded his museum in Cristo Rey, which is open to the public. And um, it's not hard to find. If you're passing through the, how they call it, the Corozal Bypass, um, or some people call it the Remati Road, you're not going to be able to miss it. It's the second village, and you have a big sign that says, uh, the museum is to your right. And there you go. You have Mr. Mr. Yam proudly showcasing the welcome um, sign to his museum. And here are some presentations at his home happening. Here at the bottom, he is practicing the traditional Hanal Pishan at the Bankita House of Culture. And here he's setting up a traditional altar. And of course, he he does whenever he does this kind of things, he teaches you. He's telling you why he does certain things and why the traditional um, is the way it is and why is it the Maya believe in such traditions. The next person that uh, we, we feel is one of our local leaders and we're proud of her is the late Miss Ernestina Mo, better known as Doña Tina. And uh, she's originally from Caledonia Corozal. She spearheaded and led the Caledonia Compar uh, Carnival, Carnival Group which is Las Comparsas for more than 20 years. Uh, she dedicated most of her life in teaching and reviving this along with her family. I remember talking to her uh, some years ago when she explained that it was difficult during the time that she was doing it because a lot of people did not want to continue the practice, did not want to, uh, did not believe anymore in the Carnaval. Excuse so me, it was Mr. A, yes. Sorry to cut you off. You have two more minutes. Right. So, uh, so it was kind of hard for her to continue. It was a challenge, but she gathered her, her daughters and her grandchildren to, to learn more about it. And eventually they all got into it. And today it is a family affair. Unfortunately, um, Doña Tina passed away a couple of years ago, but her legend continues and her family continues to celebrate Las Comparsas and celebrate her as well. Here are some pictures of the traditional Comparsas in Caledonia in Orange Walk as well. And the last but not the least, Don Pete Carrillo. Um, he's one of our leaders as well in the community. Mr. Pete uh, is originally from San Lazaro Village, and he's an avid promoter of Yucatec culture in the sense of sharing his knowledge on traditional religious festivals, such as uh, Las Mestizadas. He also talks about the early settlement days of San Lazaro. He teaches the Maya language. He talks about folk stories, the beliefs, um, and he also gives you a little walk through his uh, garden, botanical garden that he, he along with his son, Ugo, have created. Uh, last year, uh, along with his son, Ugo, after collecting so many information and putting it together, they founded the Uchan Mul Yash Kash, which is a small museum uh, showcasing the Maya heritage. So for that purpose, we also celebrate Don Pete as one of our local leaders. Uh, Mr. Pete is here. He's talking here at the Banquitas House of Culture. His wife unfortunately passed away in, in May. Um, she was a strong supporter of him and also she also used to tell stories when the people visited the museum. So that's pretty much for my part. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cantun, for your uh, nice presentation. Very excellent. Okay. So now I'd like to say, uh, first of all, thank you to all the presenters who did a great job in sharing their knowledge about Marcos Canu and of course, some of the events surrounding him as a hero. I'm sure that our listeners in Belize and abroad have learned a great deal and uh, may also want to learn more about Marcos Canu and other contemporary Maya leaders. Now it's time for our discussion. However, I'd like to uh, remind the presenters to unmute their mics when it's time for them to speak. So uh, with that said, Mr. Ross, the time is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for all these presentations here. I, I'm, I'm so glad that something like Marcos Canol and the heritage of Marcos Canol um, has become a very uh, mainstream and important um, present set of presentations as such. I remember as a youngster um, being an avid reader of what is Maya and in fact, I, if I remember clearly, it was back in 1979 when I first read about Marcos Canola and the Battle of Orange Walk. 
And it was on an unfortunate article because it was one written by um, Charles Emmons, um, Chuck Emmons, at, um, and I read it at Muffles College. And it talked about the savages, the Maya savages, and Marcos Cano, one of the leaders of the savage Mayas as such. No? So I'm glad that the real stories over the years have been coming out and we're understanding the context and the story of the Mayas and Marcos Canel much more, um, much more historically accurate as such. No? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to check to see what questions have been posed. Um, I think we have asked that you pose them in the chat as such. So uh, we will look at that. Okay. Um, Questions in the chat. Any, any, anyone has any questions? I know this. It's a lot of um, very good celebrations, very good um, mentions of of what is happening. Um, anybody has any questions that they want to ask any of our presenters at this point in time? Okay, one of the first questions is for um, for Ian, Mr. Vasquez. Ian, Mr. Ras, it's been so long you forgot my name. Ian, sorry, I, I forget the G. Ian, <laughs> if you were to compare the causes of Marcos Canol and the modern cause of the Maya in the South, what would you point out? That's a very diff difficult question. Delmar is just trying to pull my leg here. Uh, Delmar is trying to put me on the spot. But don't worry, Delmar, I'm going to rise to the challenge, even though you're putting, putting me on the spot here. Right? Uh, I, I'm not sure what you refer to in terms of the causes in the South, in the, in, the, in, the, in the issues in the South, but I would believe that you're referring to the land issue and the Maya uh, seeing the land issue as communal and fighting for communal rights as opposed to private property. And I think that is the road that Delmar wants this discussion to go. And when I look at it, uh, what you see in the South in terms of communal land rights is the same thing that you saw that Marcos Canon was fighting for. Uh, he, in effect, saw the territory, parts of Belize, a large part of the northern section of Belize, as part of the patrimony of the Maya of the Ikai Che, Chichen Ha, and uh, the larger Maya groups there uh, that had their homes in the Mexican side, but their power or their outreach extended far beyond their home villages, their home tongues to areas in Belize. So they saw the territory that was occupied by the British here on this side as part of that patrimony. So it ties in perfectly into that Maya worldview. And I, I would extend to go to a discussion uh, on what Mr. Roy mentioned, the Chaktimal Maya, because that was absent from the presentation here today, where the Chaktimal Maya having their main settlement at Santa Cruz, at, at Santa Rita, sorry, controlled a large portion of what is present day Chetomal and in the Bay of Chetomal. Uh, so it's important, and sometime we, may, we might have to have a discussion on Maya polities and how Ma the Maya saw their political structures, how they viewed it and how they determined territories, because that's another issue. Like now, you can compare and say they are the same things, because the Maya in the South fighting for communal rights, Marcos Canul, being so vigilant about the rights of his people and that his people not be disenfranchised. Although the British call him, as Miss Peterson says, thief, rebel, what he in fact was doing was putting down his foot saying, you owe me rent. You owe me rent because you are taking mahogany out of Ikaiche territory. And by so doing, you, you are taking from our patrimony and so you must pay. So all he was doing is exercising that authority as a leader of that Maya polity. Okay, thank you, Gian. Um, the the other question, and I'm not so sure um, who is best capable of addressing this, but maybe Arturo, maybe Andy, 
Um, how do we make this history relevant to the young Masawal scattered and with a lost language and disconnected from their customs, right? Okay, I, I would give it a try. I think uh, precisely what we're doing right now, activities like this is what helps uh, for us to connect the young people with uh, their culture. These like these uh, activities and much of what several other organizations in across the country are doing in the classrooms when it, whenever it comes about teaching history, we also have to not only tell them what the, the textbooks are saying, because in much most of the times the textbook is his history. It's the history, whoever writes it, that's the way it's done. A lot of oral history has been forgotten. A lot of oral history is disregarded and we need to push this forward. And that is the reason some of the activities and projects that we have taken as a Northern Maya Association is to collect, to collate, to uh, record this and also share it with, with the wider, um, wider population, the, lighter, the, the wider audience. We are never gonna go back to where we were because it's difficult to change back time, but we can make a difference from today onwards. And I believe that this is how we can do it. It's teaching the history the way our forefathers told us the history. And that might instigate some, sign of, some sense of pride, some si sense of appreciation in, among our young people. Just like I think the other question is about, uh, from Mr. Vasquez, Duin Vasquez, saying, why hasn't the streets of Orange Walk and Corozal been named after prominent individuals? And that is one way of doing it. Uh, Mr. Roy Rodriguez and I have spoken some time ago, um, and we talked about it. We spoke to, at that time, the, the mayors of that time about, you know, considering renaming certain streets. It is something that has to be done in consultation, they told us. We, for example, here in San Jose Palmar, we have made it at least uh, partially that we have named certain streets on, uh, after our, our own leaders, some of them being Maximo Plaza, the other one being about uh, other streets being named after prominent uh, leaders of the community. So things like these go a far away in instigating pride and appreciation for our people. Those are my thoughts. Can I jump in there too? in this conversation. Thank, thank you, Arturo. I was going to ask Andy, but go ahead, Jen. Um, uh, Arturo mentioned education and re-educating uh, the youths and the general Belizean population. Uh, he mentioned two oral history. For a long time, I've thought Mr. Ross has taught us as history students, me and Delmer and the rest of that cohort, uh, that oral history is as important as it is. Lots of it needs to be cross-referenced and needs to be verified because so much so that you want to transmit that oral history, some of it is inaccurate. Some of it uh, does more damage to the history than reveal the real history. And so whenever we venture down that road, I think it has to be a consorted effort with both because the oral history is very important. There's so much to learn from it. But in terms of a historical tool, it has to be combined with more historical research, archival research to verify some of the things that are being said that are being transmitted so that we get a real holistic picture. And in terms of uh, capturing the youth and renaming streets and so forth, that would be a, a marvelous effort. But I think more, more so the works of what we see in uh, Masewalon and uh, other organizations that are emerging. We're seeing more Maya presentations, more Maya culture becoming visible. You have uh, the POC teams now organizing in Belize, going to compete in Mexico, going to compete in Guatemala. These are the things that we need to, in my opinion, revive. I can recall going to Queen Elizabeth Park to see the groups from Caledonia doing uh, presentations, wonderful presentations. And uh, like me, I, I don't know the language. Things like this needs to be revived. The language, the culture, the displays be more out there in terms of what is our uh, overall culture. Go ahead, Mr. Roy. Mr. Roy has his hand up. Yes, please, Mr. Roy, join the discussion. 
Mr. Roy needs to unmute himself. Unmute. Okay. Um, Tony Masewalon is currently planning to use music to connect with the youth, where we are going to have more Maya taught to young people. And then of course, the translation of popular songs or, or the rap songs or whatever into the Maya language. And then we sing that. So we are in the process of using music to connect to the young people, connect the Maya to the young people. I just want to mention that you know, as, a, a, as a plan, as a working plan. Excellent initiative. Um, I wanted to add a one on the name of the street. There is actually a street in Orange Walk that has the name of Marcos Canul. There is actually a community park named Marcos Canul. Um, and we hope to see more names um, given to the to the local um, leaders, right? Street names and uh, stuff like that. Um, I want to mention also that the only way that we can uh, preserve our culture and other generation is by transmitting the knowledge of the elders to the youths. For example, in the village of Shaibe, Mr. Roy, Ms. Adela, and Ms. Kano, they are teaching the Maya language, the Maya dances to a younger generation. On my part, I am working on the preservation of the Maya spirituality. On the question of, about the Spanish dances, I believe it's very important for us. And that is something that I have discussed with our Mexican Mayan brothers. And only the Maya can do it. Create a process of decolonization of our Mayan traditions and of our Mayan customs. Thank you very much. Okay. And um, one, one last question before we close off um how how is it that or how can the struggle of the mayas in the south align with the historical resistance that the great chief marcos canol have in other words how can the the the, um, the the mayas of the south and 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 i know none none of the presenters here can speak directly to the mayas of the south but there is a a an organization, BENIC, the Belize National Indigenous Council, that is um, has 15 members in the executive, five um, from the North Yucatec representation, five from the South Maya representation, the, um, the Mopan and Kakchi, and five from the Garifuna. And so there is a joining of, of resources and joining of cause that is going on, but um, Miss Adela or, or Andy, um, and and the efforts like teacher teacher fell in Yo Creek and Arturo and and Carmen and others in San Jose Palmar, and um, how can how can uh, there be a combination of the struggles going on in the south with what the north is doing? Anybody? Anybody okay. want to take up that question? Yes, Mr. Roy, go this, ahead. Yeah. I think we can start by understanding the problems of being of our brothers and sisters, the Maya brothers and sisters in the South. You will find that, for instance, the Yucatec Maya in Corozal are not moment, at the moment, no? And are not at the moment in tune with what is happening with our brothers and sisters in, 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 in Southern Belize, the, the, the Kekchi and the Mopan. What we need to know is to start knowing more about them, connecting with them through organizations like Tone, and, and also uh, understanding what is their problem, which is similar to ours. And that's where we connect with Marcos Canul because what they are fighting, as I think Arturo said, is, 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 is that uh, ancestral land right. 
In Corozal and Orange York, we have faced a different colonizing history, you know, from what happened. I think that can be studied also historically with what happened during the British colonial period and now. But Corozal, by the 18, what we were talking 1870 when Kano occupies, no one, no Maya in Corozal and no Yucatec Maya could own land. No, none of them. Because all the land was owned by British. You know, you know their names now. So what we need to know is come closer with them. How can we share their problems? Because we are not facing it today. You know, I think Adelita mentioned also that in 1960 in the north, George Price's uh, land resettlement program for the planting of sugarcane ended up in, in the Mayas getting a 30 acre land to work sugarcane and of course maybe a little plot to, to work their milpas. But that is as far as it happened here. So we are not experiencing the same problems as our Maya brothers in the South. We should start to learn more, have more connection with them and, and support and support actively their uh, 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 resistance. So I, I think what they're facing is, is very serious. And uh, it, it needs a lot of analysis and study. Because a lot of people think that if you give the lands to the, to, 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 to the Maya people, the Kechi, you, you, will, be, you, you will be actually uh, giving a land that later on the same Maya may sell it. So that communal uh, ownership is, is important so as not to, 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 to come up with a private ownership of land. I, 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 I do support that. And I think we, we as Maya, Yucatec Maya, Tone Masewalo, the Northern Maya Association of Leeds, we have to learn more about them and interact and support their program openly to the government of Leeds. Thank you very much, Mr. Rodriguez, and, and I agree with you. And, and as a past executive member of Benic, I, I think I know some of the people that we need to light the fire under to make sure that they can they can bring this together. What yes. you are suggesting, the Yucatec and the Mokan and the Kechi um, can bring it together, even with the Garifuna, who's the other indigenous community as such. No, so but thank Mr. you all for the presentations and for being ready to was, answer. Let, let me just, yes, let me just mention one thing. The Garifuna is not indigenous to Belize. I think you know that. Yes. And, and once upon a time, I spoke to some Kechi Maya, you know, because I had a opportunity to go to Toledo. And they were claiming that the uh, uh, Garifuna were not supporting them in their land rights, communal land rights, ancestral rights. And, and maybe it came to my mind that, I mean, we should know that the Garifuna are not indigenous to Belize. They are indigenous to the Caribbean, not to the Caribbean islands. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Roy. And thanks to the other presenters. And I turn it over back to the Masters of Ceremony, Mr. Berganza. Thank you, Mr. Ross. So that concludes today's event. I would like to thank all the viewers, presenters, and especially the organizers. We extend a heartfelt gratitude in making today's event groundbreaking. <clears throat> we hope that we can have more forums like this in the future. And also to our viewers, we hope that it was educational and informative. And thank you so much for being with us until the end. Stay safe. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Oh, yeah.